Uh, Michael, I think I probably don't need to introduce the product too much because you just had 20 minutes of it from Manish. So I, I work for DGRAPH. Um, I'm part of building the, um, as Manish was talking about, sort of bringing DGRAPH back towards, towards GraphQL, so our sort of GraphQL spec compliance support. So um, you've already heard DGRAPH's a um, graph database, transactional, serves GraphQL natively. Um, so I don't think there's any more intro that I can give, sorry. <laughs> Hey, I'm Robert. Uh, I work at AWS, and uh, one of the services that we have at AWS is called AppSync. Uh, it's technically part of the Amplify set of services, and with AppSync, uh, this is one of the GraphQL as a service offerings that, um, that is out there today. And it's best known for its ability to kind of automatically generate a lot of the, the back end that you would otherwise be building by hand. Um, and it's also well known for its ability to uh, uh, create all this stuff in a serverless manner. Um, so as far as the relevance of this conversation goes, um, AppSync actually uh, can generate the tables for you uh, inside DynamoDB, which is our NoSQL uh, database on AWS. And then it can also use uh, uh, Aurora serverless. And Aurora, for those of you who don't know, is um, our, our uh, in-house engine for our relational data service. Um, and RD, uh, Aurora can also be configured to run uh, with compatibility mode for either MySQL or Postgres. So I think it's, it's kind of interesting that it crosses so many different thresholds. And, and I hope we, hope we get some, some time to cover that uh, as, as the conversation goes on. Um, yeah, and I think to kind of round that out, um, I'm from Hasura. Surprise. Uh, and um, and um, we take, um, and Hasura helps you kind of get a GraphQL API ready on top of uh, different data sources, but primarily um, known for our support with Postgres. Uh, and that's kind of um, the piece that's relevant to this conversation. Um, I think what, what I'd love to kind of start off with a little bit to set context for everybody is what is the current you know, GraphQL journey for a developer using the product, right? Look, how how does a user kind of go through uh, their setup of the GraphQL API, and what does that look like? Uh, Michael Manish has already done the work for you, but I mean, you can you, know, <laughs> you can start off a little bit. So, so again, you saw it just a second ago, but ba basically, DGraph was designed around GraphQL itself anyway. So the so the way you set up a schema in in DGraph is by describing your types in GraphQL, and um, from that you get a running DGraph instance and in the I guess the important thing from DGraph's perspective, which is a little bit different to the other two, is that there's no sort of translation to something else underneath. We don't compile a set of tables or something from that. It's just that, I mean, DGraph just speaks GraphQL. It's a database of nodes and edges between those nodes and the types of those nodes. So you go sort of straight from the schema to a, a database that can serve queries um, and mutations on that schema. So they sort of the, the app journey is very much, I'm designing my GraphQL app. I design my schema, and you know, that, that's that's what I get in my database. So that's the the the, the journey is just GraphQL in the end. Yeah, and the developer experience for AppSync is. Um, it's going to be familiar to you if you're an AWS user, but all of our services are accessible by either using the AWS console, which gives you more of a, a GUI-based workflow. Uh, they're also accessible via the SDK. And then in, in the case of Amplify, uh, we have a suite of command line tools that allows you to go and spin up all of this infrastructure. And the Amplify suite is actually a lot broader than just AppSync. Uh, it's actually doing a lot in terms of uh, generating your entire application stack um, and then generating pipelines associated with that stack, um, giving you provisions for testing and um, and all sorts of things, right? Um, it, Amplify even has uh, an, auth, um, an auth component to it, where you can kind of connect it with Cognito user pools, so you get you know all the things that we've built thousands of times over, uh, you know, user registration, uh, password reset, all this stuff. Um, you know, you don't have to do that undifferentiated heavy lifting anymore. Um, and not only that, you actually have integrated uh, um, uh, controls in iOS and Android. And there's a bunch of other cool stuff in Amplify that I'm not going to get um, be able to cover. But, but I think that I, I didn't want to mention the developer experience with AppSync by itself, because AppSync by itself actually is less of a common use case than AppSync as part of the Amplify story. So I think the, the, the overall journey is you, know, you actually think about the, the application first. You know, what is the user experience? Is it a mobile app? Is it a web app? Um, and then you're thinking about uh, how, do I, how am I doing user management because that's one of the first problems you solve. And then later on, are you getting down into the, um, the GraphQL schema? So once you do actually get down to the GraphQL schema level, 
you have quite a bit of flexibility. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned that you can do is you can map the schema directly to um, DynamoDB tables or Aurora serverless tables, which is where you will pers persist individual entries for a particular type. But um, suppose that you want a field that doesn't quite map so cleanly to directly to the persistence format. What do you do? Um, and there, there's, this, there's, a, there's a number of escape hatches that you can use to whether you want to do um, something like custom authentication or custom authorization, you can do that. Um, and by the way, these things in AppSync, these are called data sources, and you can create these custom data sources that allows you to hook it up to, to anything you want. What you get out of the box is the default data source where you can hook it up to a database, and then you have this kind of um, this simple, simple use case. But for the advanced use cases, you can add these custom uh, data sources that can talk to a Lambda function, for example. Um, and you can also add, uh, there's this new feature that shipped last year called a pipeline resolver. And so the pipeline resolver is actually a really cool feature inside AppSync. It allows you to take, say, I, I want a field, and I don't want that field to just do one thing. Uh, I actually want that field to kick off sort of a workflow. And you know, imagine that uh, um, you have some sort of um, uh, uh, AI-driven, you, know, you, you upload a picture and you're going to tag the picture. That's a lot of steps, right? You, you have to upload it somewhere. You have to basically segment the image. You have to label it. You have to, you have, you have to produce the results. And then you, so wh when you do that, what you can do with the pipeline resolver is you can sp specify all these steps, and you can have the output of one step chain into the step. And at the very end, you can send that back, and you can send that back as a result of the resolver. So, uh, Long-winded way of saying that um, Amplify, AppSync, you know, they're really kind of uh, uh, the best case for AppSync is to use it as part of the entire Amplify tool chain and to build your entire application stack end to end. And then you get a lot of stuff around just, just GraphQL. Because GraphQL, now, sorry, I know I'm taking up a lot of time. I just need a few more minutes. Um, but you know, it, it reminds me that GraphQL is actually a very interesting um, phenomenon because what what everybody sees as GraphQL, what was open sourced in 2015, um, if, you were to, if you were to visualize the entire stack at Facebook, it's a rich stack, it's an integrated stack. No, if you were to go back in, in a time machine, or if, if Lee were here, you'd ask him, like, would anybody be able to point to this thing and say, like, in 2014, yes, this is GraphQL? The answer is no. Uh, GraphQL was actually extracted uh, um, and, and, and we had to take a look at the stack and go, okay, well, this is GraphQL. This, and it's actually quite a thin layer. If you look at you know, the rest of the GraphQL stack at Facebook, it's got Relay, it's got a whole bunch of query persistence, it's got a whole bunch of tooling on the back end. Uh, the server is a whole other story. So, and, and you know that there's experimental features in production like live queries and defer and stream. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. And GraphQL is just one thin layer. And, it's, and that's, what I, that's the way I want you to think about AppSync and Amplify, is that it is, it is piece by piece building out the rest of the stack around GraphQL, because it real, that, that team realizes that GraphQL by itself, it solves some problems, but really what it, what it causes you to do is go and look for more solutions. <laughs> that's an appropriate answer. Um, I think, so, so if, I, if I summarize, I think with, with dgraph, there's kind of like a schema-first approach to the database itself. So you're starting off with the GraphQL schema to kind of describe your database, and then you're kind of iterating on the schema, and that's mapped, and that's kind of driving what the database is like, right? Is there, um, are, are you also looking at other cases where you already have dgraph, or, and then you're generating a GraphQL API, and do you see an impedance mismatch where the GraphQL SDL does not allow you to, does not allow you to model concepts inside dgraph complete, or dgraph has more power than what the GraphQL SDL offers you. Is, have, those, have those kinds of things happened? Yeah, so obviously we have existing users who have dgraph databases that are not necessarily GraphQL databases. Um, largely because the sort of natural data model is just a graph, um, you know, that those, those can largely be represented as GraphQL really quite easily. So we have a few ways that weren't in Manisha's talk, but where you can take an existing dgraph database um, and sort of lay GraphQL on top of it. There's a few interesting little quirks there, like, for example, dgraph allows you a whole bunch of stuff, like you could you can use Chinese characters in your um, edge names, for example, which is not valid in, in GraphQL. So we have to have a way of, you know, when you expose a GraphQL interface, you've got to just have, you know, um, alphanumeric characters and things. So we actually have to have you know, even if the underlying data structure is the same as GraphQL, representable in GraphQL, we actually have to have a few little tricks there anyway to kind of be able to represent the underlying dgraph. So largely, you've got nodes and edges, um, they've got 
they've got types on the edges, we can, we can represent those fairly well in GraphQL. There's a few things like Minish said, like we've got a date time type in dgraph, we've got some geo types, we've got a few other things that are, um, that are not there, which we, you know, we can bubble up into GraphQL with our own custom scalers, it's a bit like what you were talking about before. Um, uh, the, the real big difference for us is the queries, like Manish said, like we have a whole bunch of query power that's not, that's not GraphQL query power. So things like Manish showed before, things that look like, like joins across, like you've got multiple query blocks which GraphQL has, but we can use the results we've calculated in one part of the query to then inject as sort of search terms or variables or whatever in the next part of the query and then this all sort of flows on. So you end up, you know, you want to do some sort of complex um, data manipulation within your graph or some sort of complex join and you can just sort of put it in as one as one query. So there's a bigger impedance mismatch between the, the query language than there is between the between the data model itself. So I, I think in general the sort of description of the the database ends up being fairly natural but there, there's this extra query power or database power and the, the same is true in um, in Azure and things as well, like you've got, there's a, there's a bunch of power you have inside Postgres or whatever that's, you know, less, less easy to bubble up into the, into the query language. So that, that's the big thing for us is getting that dgraph query power represented as a way that people can access a GraphQL. Got it. Got it. And so just kind of a follow up to that, you know, I, I wanted to ask this question of Manesh, but he ran out of time at the end. You know, you have this dialect of GraphQL and he mentioned that GraphQL plus minus was the decision to fork GraphQL. Now you kind of went back on that and said, well, can we get back to standards compliant GraphQL? Uh, did you encounter any features inside GraphQL plus minus that make you think this is just generally, we should upstream this, we should contribute this back as an RFC? Because some of those features, like the, 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 um, the multiple languages, um, you know, they're very interesting, but I wonder what the general applicability of that is. So does any one feature stand out to you, maybe one or two top features where you say this, is, this should be really be upstream, this should be part of the general GraphQL language? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question given your, given your talk before. So I feel like I'd be, um, you know, I'd be on level zero of the, um, of, the, of the flow you showed for upstreaming things. But I think, I, I think you're right. There's a couple of things there, like, like um, having languages natively and ma maybe even the, the edge names and things would be, would be interesting. But um, I think the things for us that we, we just do all the time um, in, in dgraph are, are things like those multiple query blocks and calculating variables and things. And I'm not sure, like I, I think you could with, um, you know, uh, with directives have a way you could collect a variable value and then use that la later on. But then, like, like you said before, you'd have to have a way that everybody could do that. And that would mean that all the GraphQL um, query resolvers and things would have to be able to do that um, kind of processing. So I'm not sure whether those things, um, they'd be Great for us to expose them using directives and for people to be able to access them in you know, a GraphQL compliant way, but I'm not sure whether um, those kind of database things, whether you'd get as much buy-in um, from the sort of broader GraphQL community. But then, then again, like, like you said, languages, um, some of the sort of calculation stuff that we have, like counting edges and things, feel like they'd be really nice to instead of just say, I want the list of friends to say, just could you count the list for me? Th th those kind of things would be really helpful in general in GraphQL. The sort of some of the more complex database-y things would be harder to implement um, for, for everybody in every, every, every implementation. But I think there are certainly some things there, yeah, count, languages, some of those things would be, would be nice in a just general GraphQL framework, yeah. Yeah. Tanma, how about you? I mean, in, in the process of working with Hasura, you know, I, I, as you look at the language itself and its ability to express the, um, act as this kind of layer right above the database, uh, would, you, would you push any features up the other way? Um, no, because so I guess I guess Hasura's context is a little bit interesting. Um, there, there isn't anything that stands out in particular, but to kind of backtrack a little bit, the way the so so there's kind of like a schema first approach that and the, and a kind of a schema first approach where you're taking with AppSync as well, right? The with Hasura, the the it's it's a metadata first approach. So what you're doing is so so the way when we when we kind of built Hasura, we wanted it to work really well with existing databases. So the, the, the way we created the abstractions were very different. So what we said is we'll have, we'll have a metadata kind of a, a language, a DSL, right? And what that'll help you do is map DML concepts or, or map concepts inside the, the database that can be queried or mutated, right? And we'll map that to GraphQL, right? And so, so what you're really doing when you're using Hasura is you're not specifying a schema with GraphQL. You're specifying your schema in the database's native language itself, which is in this case SQL DDL. Um, and then what you're doing is um, you're specifying kind of mappings from tables or views into GraphQL. So 
so what ends up happening is that the the kind of the kind of impedance mismatch that will always happen because because databases and like sql for example is is extremely powerful right and i mean one of the most fundamental things is that a, uh, a sql query can return a type that is uh, a, 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 that is kind of defined as you make the query right whereas with graphql the idea is that you there is a predefined type and you're querying a subset of that type at most you're not you're not creating a new type as you query it right um, and so the way that works with hasra is that you can create kind of a named query or a table and then what hasra will do is map the graphql schema or or create a graphql schema from those views and tables um, and then generate the graphql schema on top so that kind of avoids this impedance mismatch problem because one it doesn't interfere with the data modeling um, where where uh, where a lot of attempts that were made early in the ecosystem to to use the graphql sdl to kind of map to relational databases as a modeling thing uh, always broke down as soon as the use case got a little bit complicated you know they they that 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 approach kind of breaks down very quickly right and you need raw database power um and the on the other side instead of kind of trying to um trying to abstract the full sql uh dialect uh, the, the, the all of sql what we're doing is we're mapping to a subset of sql um that is possible and sql itself allows you to kind of create these new types that can that can map to hasura so so that's kind of the approach that hasura takes and um and kind of similar to appsync is uh, is where hasura also allows uh, the the, the metadata kind of allows of a type that is backed by a table or a view to be extended um and be mapped to a, a custom resolver so it can be mapped to uh, an api or a rest api or a serverless function or it can be actually mapped to a field that's coming from another graphql server right um and we call these remote joins because you're joining kind of across well not uh, across different data sources right um and so so in that sense it's kind of similar to appsync but the experience for the user is metadata first um a lot of users don't see this because when you're using the hasura console um you like everything is ui 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 but actually what's happening underneath it is that these snippets of metadata are being generated which which do this right and so you can write that metadata too so um so to kind of like the the short answer to the question is we avoid the impedance mismatch or like we we don't need graphql itself to be augmented for for that to happen um i think the one thing that would be a little bit beneficial um uh, would be for those use cases that are kind of data centric where you're seeing filtering logic and pagination logic and stuff like that having a standardish format for being able to filter through things and paginate through things and order things would be nice but it's a bit of a rabbit hole to go down to uh, to, to go to kind of go into that's right? in a query language right it's yeah, exactly, a query right? language and not yeah, an api yeah. language so, so 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 you could kind of add a you could kind of enforce that on top of a basic graphql kind of spec make sure that your query arguments have these filtering and pagination kind of things that will make it easier but but everything is going to be different and different databases are going to have different filtering operations right like for if uh, when we support postgres you'll have like rich post gis operations so you can do location kind of queries but as we support mysql that is not going to be the case you're not going to see those operators right so it's hard to kind of do that although the kind of the bi community and the data visualization community the bi tools right all of these tools would benefit by having like a standardized graphql thing because like tableau uses sql to connect to any database tableau can now use graphql to connect to whatever right and then query that so there is there is there are interesting possibilities there but i'm not sure about whether that should be something that we kind of upstream into the spec i think the i think you've sort of half answered the quest the, the point with what you've said at first which is that you know with both azure and dgraph you end up um what you want to expose is a little bit more intentional than a database like a database is meant to be very generic you can do anything in a database like you said you can um you can reformulate your sql query into whatever structure you want and as minish showed before you can do the same in dgraph you can get some data and join it and munge it and get a different result structure out and that's great for a database but then what you want to present in something like graphql is is an api it's a more intentional thing that you've got an in, you've got an intended use case that people want to use it for there's in data structures you intend to expose and functions you ex intend to expose um so it's you know some of those things that you feel like oh i'd really love to be able to do x is a bit more like tanmai said that's a bit more like well from my graphql schema then i want x to be this bit of sql or this bit of plus minus or something um you don't necessarily want you know every schema to expose the same the same things because of that intentional nature of the api yeah and that that's interesting because uh, shortly before the you know the panel uh, you and i were talking about uh do you see this kind of future path for dgraph as one where we've 
eliminated the need for an application tier. I wonder, I think that's interesting to the audience here, so maybe you can kind of replay some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, we're probably all partly in the same boat in, in answer to that. I think, the, like, you know, DGRAF's this massive, powerful database. You can do all these wonderful graph queries, but at some point there's that little bit of application logic you, you want to have for, for, for whatever reason, and to be able to have that in your API is a, is a really nice thing. So having ways, I mean, GraphQL is really great for this, right? Like, like you said, um, there are ways you can mash together, you know, using Azure Remote Joins or other tools, you can mash together bits of, bits of API. So, um, you know, the thing about GraphQL is you get schema introspection, you get um, you get types, you get all of those sorts of things. So you can take a, you know, little bits of serverless stuff or little bits of, a little bit of DGRAPH, a little bit of something else and, you know, put them together and make a, to make a whole product. So, so I think one of the cool things about GraphQL is that you can do, like, like, like we said, you can just sort of spin up a DGRAPH instance and get all of this graph power, but then you can also add that little bit of logic as well. And so you, it's nice that there's an ecosystem of tools where you, you're not just stuck with, you know, oh, I spun something up and there's no way I can extend it. I think one of the really cool things about GraphQL is, you know, GraphQL can be, it can be middleware, it can be, you know, what you're exposed to the client, it can be, you know, it can be a whole bunch of things and there's, there's nice tooling around that to help you with, all, with, you know, other bits of logic, you know, including things from other databases, all that kind of stuff is, you know, is, is nice in GraphQL, I think. How, 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 do, how do you think about the application serverness with, with GraphQL? Like, where does... Where does a traditional application server go, and how does um, in, in, in that kind of app sync or amplify GraphQL stack? Yeah, I, I mean, speaking from personal experience, I've mostly been working with, uh, a, a, I guess, a pretty classic setup, which is you know how you have an application tier with a with a pretty heavy domain model, and the domain model is doing kind of two things at once. It's, one, it's enforcing these business logic rules, and second, it's um, providing some sort of mapping into the persistence layer. Uh, and, and I think, I still believe that that is the model that gives you the most amount of flexibility. Right. Um, and also, there's, I, I think that's the model that lets you use the most amount of tools uh, uh, existing, leverage the most amount of existing knowledge, which is something that I place a big premium on. Right. You know, I, I know we, um, we're, as developers, you know, we're always distracted by the shiny new thing, but at a certain point, you know, we do have to build useful working software, and that generally requires using what we know. Uh, unfortunately, right, it would be great if we could just spend all of our time learning new things. Um, and so I, 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 really, you know, I, I really prioritize that uh, personally. Um, I, so I think, I think what, what you see with a lot of these, um, these DSLs is the need to kind of learn a new set of things. And as always, when you learn a new set of things, uh, you can you go through that you know that that, that graph of um, right. the hype cycle right you, right. you know, initially because you're getting up and running it's it's very productive because you're on the garden path as you get off right. of the garden path you realize how it deals with errors you realize there were all these edge cases that you used to know how to solve like exception handling you know right. uh, analytics performance you used to know how to solve them with the previous stack but now you're moving into this brave new world of right. serverless let's say right suddenly those problems are now at the at the forefront, and they keep bubbling up as you start to, and while you're trying to, to launch a production scale app. So I think it's, you have to kind of strike a delicate balance. Um, there's, okay. there's this trick that um, um, a teammate of mine, uh, he gave it a name. I think it's, it's got a lot of names, but, but he calls it the golden, the golden ticket rule. And that when you start a new uh, a software project, you get two golden tickets. Uh, these are like the Willy Wonka golden tickets, right? Every time you make a, uh, every time you choose a new technology, you tear up one of these golden Good. tickets. Yeah. And when you run out of them, you just have to use boring technology from there on out. <laughs> And I kind of like that idea. <laughs> Have a finite number of like these yeah, options. Yeah, exactly. Makes sense. Makes sense. I think I think that I, I think the 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 application server perspective is very interesting to us as well because the way we think about Hasura is is kind of like saying that it's the um, we we want we want Hasura to kind of take away the complexity of what a typical application server would have had. But in a context where things are becoming kind of like you have multiple databases, you have microservices, increasingly you have serverless functions, right? Um, and so the kind of, so, so, so kind of like, so some parts of Hasura, the way it behaves is it's kind of like a container for your serverless function. So what ends up happening is that Hasura is kind of like a front to the GraphQL API that you set up, either with metadata or your, a, a GraphQL annotation that you've given. Um, and then Hasura kind of delegates that to a serverless function. Um, and, then, and then the GraphQL bits, Right? The bits that kind of require the coordination across these things are taken care of by Hasura. Um, and, and the piece that we added to that that was, that was extremely important to us and then to our users was this ability to add a, a security layer as well. 
Um, and so, would kind of love to talk a little bit about how you think about adding, uh, or if you have a perspective on that GraphQL security or not. Um, the way we do it in Hasura is, um, it's very similar to, it's, it's basically a, a rule engine. So what happens is that as users specify security rules, um, the security rule can be a reference to anything in the data graph. Um, and then what Hasura does is that when the GraphQL query kind of comes in, and Hasura realizes that this portion of the GraphQL query goes to the database, Hasura adds that permission rule and mixes that and compiles that into the SQL query. So if you're saying query profile ID name, Hasura converts that to select ID comma name from profile where ID equal to cookie.user ID, right? And this is, this is extremely efficient for like the things that are querying the database because you're, you're pushing down that authorization logic in the cases that it can be into the database itself, right? Um, and, and so that's been really, that's been very important to us and to our users for, for being able to get productive in a real world setting as quickly as possible, right? So that's, that's, been, that's been interesting. I'm wondering what, what kind of the security story um, with DGraph or, uh, or what perspective there is with, with that thing. Yeah, so DGraph has um, edge level security at the moment. So you can specify, so particular um, database users have access or not access to particular fields in the ed or edges in the graph. So you can, you can restrict um, who can access what edges, but you can't do what you, you just described where you can say, does the incoming user have some relationship to the actual data in the graph? So that's some, um, and I think that's a really natural question. As soon as you, like while DGraph is not quite GraphQL compliant and you have to do something in order to get GraphQL or some other, you know, expose something else, you've always got that, you've always got that layer in between and so you've always got to just put your, you know, that, that sort of more complicated auth in there. But then as soon as you have what we saw before, and you've got a GraphQL schema straight out of the box, the, the natural next question is, oh gee, I'd really like to say, you know, that, that, that object is only accessible if you're the ID of the person in the object. And so I, definitely that's something we, we you know, keep talking about is that that, but I think the difference for us is that you, know, you express it at the level of the underlying database and that's then a, a mapping, as you said, is where we'd probably express it in the GraphQL itself as a, you know, a restriction, as a, some sort of um, directive on, you know, this type is accessible when the values match up. But, but is, there a need, is there a need for DGraph to do that considering that you're expecting, you're expecting like application level logic or business logic to be using DGraph, right? Um, in those cases, um, you know, wouldn't they be taking care of these kind of security and authorization rules or do you, even, do you see the requirement for that, for that to even be done in DGraph? I think, I think yes. Because, um, like you said, with things like serverless and stuff, it, it's, it feels like such a natural model when you've got a sort of a really powerful graph there to just want to spin up the graph. Like, and as you said before, just want to spin that up and then start writing my app and I've got all the auth and stuff already there. So that feels like a really natural model and really natural way to, to write an app is that th this thing is like a, a package of like graph power or whatever, whatever you want to call it. And if I just wrap a few extra little things around it, it feels like it becomes a bit more like a... Um, like a, a dev tool or a, you know, that, that sort of thing. So it, so it feels like that's, and you know, definitely we get people asking that question. So it feels like that's an important thing to do. But I, yeah, I also think, and same as what we said before, at some point, yes, you might end up with, you know, you end up writing code in the middle. And if you're writing code in the middle, then, um, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got a programming language. So you've got, a, you've got other things in, in right. there as well. So right. That, right. Um, that's definitely still an option. Got it, got it. What about, is there a security perspective with the, um, is, is there like a security modeling thing with AppSync? I think I remember seeing the, there are, I think there are directives that, that you can annotate the schema with that would embed certain security rules when the query is going out to DynamoDB and stuff like that. What's the perspective on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, um, the, the question uh, that we've been getting over and over in the AppSync world has been how do you eject from the, the you know, if you want to apply custom authorization logic, right. do you have to use cognito user pools? Do you have to do this right. thing in this kind of prescribed way? And I think what we're seeing, you know, the, these, the, the sentiment of kind of building out this, this um, DSL for expressing certain kinds of authorization rules, certain kinds of authentication requirements is nice, but sooner or later somebody hits the wall and they need an eject button. And right. the question is how well can we provide that eject, eject. button? Um, and in the case of, um, of AppSync, you know, we kind of have, we have a pretty uh, viable escape hatch story, which is that we can always call into a Lambda function, and at that point, you can kind of Correct. do anything you want, Correct. right? Um, and so I think that's pretty flexible. Um, I, do, uh, I do wonder whether there's a way, because at some point, if you keep, if you keep pressing that escape hatch button, 
Um, you know, you have this kind of sprawling infrastructure of you know, I've got some Lambda functions over here, I've got my schema over here, I've got right. this, I've got that thing. Right. You know, the, the, the kind of making sure that the infrastructure is understandable becomes a real problem. And, and this is something that we've seen uh, as, a, as a general problem in AWS, honestly. Um, right. You know, it's, it's very easy to go and follow some docs, you know, uh, click a few buttons, and then suddenly you have, you know, like, like CloudFormation template that's 2,000 lines long, and it's spinning up a VPC in like five different regions, and, you know, right. it's deploying sprawling infrastructure that nobody understands. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that, that we're really trying to, to tackle. You know, you look, look a, lot of, a lot of the innovation around AWS is around kind of making these concepts a little bit more cohesive, a little bit more concrete, right. um, thinking about them um, more intuitively, or hiding certain things that are not uh, um, essential complexity right in front of you. Got right. it. So I think that's, that's kind of the next frontier. Got it, got it, got it. Um, do you want, do you want to I was just going to say, it, I mean, it sounds a lot like you know, we've got microservices, and microservices are awesome, but then we need like an abstraction layer on top of our microservices, right? <laughs> Yeah, this seems, like a, this seems like a broader problem that's happening yeah. anyway. It's like we have like these units of functionality that work really well, but then you have too many units of functionality and you're like, what, what do I even do? Oh, well. Um, all right, so I think, I think we can, before we kind of open it up to um, uh, uh, questions from the audience, maybe, maybe one of the last things that we can touch upon is, you know, what is the schema evolution story like right now, right? Um, and, and I mean like both schemas, right? The, the GraphQL schema itself and then the the underlying the database schema itself, right? Um, and, and depending on however that coupling is managed, um, you know, what is that schema evolution story like? Yeah, so um, as Manish described before, DGRAPH under the hood is just nodes and edges, and some of those edges lead to values. Um, and what we allow with the GraphQL is that you can modify that schema, and we try as hard as possible to not um, not fail with your with your data. So Manish showed an example before where an edge, I think it was like um, when the movie's release date was, was a string, um, and then you can change it in the next schema to being a date time. And, and what we do at that point is we don't we don't sort of try and parse the whole database and work out is everything, you know, are all of these strings date times? We, we sort of defer that to query time and, and say, well, you said it's a date time. You probably did that because you put them all in as date times and then you, you know, um, you, you realize there was a type for that. Um, so then at query time, we'll just load them, see if they're date times and you, you, you'll get an error if, you, if they're not. And then you can, go and, um, you can go and update your data. So some of those sorts of things, um, they're just edges. It's just a graph. Un under the hood, we're really, really flexible about what that graph actually, what, what it actually looks like on disk. So it doesn't have to actually look like the schema you just loaded. We'll, we'll work that out. At query time, at, yeah, at, at query time. Got it. Um, so with that, yeah, you can add edges, you can remove edges, you can you can move things around. That's that sort of stuff, it, and it's just that graph underneath that's um, that, that you that you're kind of playing with. So um, th that said, you as we were talking before, you you still end up in this situation where I had name, and then in my next version of my app, I realize it's got to be I don't know like first name and last name or something, right. and right. Then, you know then you just need a programming language and a to compute you know, you, the full name, right? Yeah, yeah, right. something, some, something like that. So there are, you know, there's, there's always a need for those data migrations that that you code up. Got it. Um, but some of them, as the schema evolves, we're happy to add new types, add new fields, slightly, you know, fiddle with the types that are on there. Those sorts of things. The graph can evolve, you know, and and as many showed, you just load the schema and dgraph is still just running because it didn't have to. It didn't have to do a data migration across the whole right. tables, which is quite different to like, like an SQL database. You want to change the structure of the tables. SQL right. wants to say, hang on. <laughs> Don't change that. <them. laughs> just just right. wait a minute while I, while I work out whether this is OK. Right. Right. We're, we're much more, we'll work it out later. Right. Um, so right. that, that sort of schema is really, really flexible. Right. Right. That, that is a frightening amount of flexibility with respect <laughs> to this <laughs> schema. You know, it, it's kind of more used to the, we have a schema with 10,000 types and it's serving this. 500 different versions of a mobile application, <laughs> and, and any any backward compatibility breaking change you make, some amount of clients are going to be broken because there's you know thousands of of and, old Android phones with, that have run out of memory that can no longer update from the App Store anymore. So, so I, I, I am I am uh, very happy to hear that you live in a world where the schemas can be versioned that that uh, that rapidly. Um, but I, I think I think that that kind of reminds me that there's this it, we truly are talking about two different layers, right? Because when you talk about this, this API, I mean, everybody agrees that, in principle, don't break the API. Um, but yet, placing that constraint at the database level, especially when you have a database with the capabilities of DGRAPH, where you can kind of have this kind of dynamic schema, um, it, it seems like what you're saying is it doesn't necessarily make sense to 
have all those constraints in place. Did you do what you need to do at the database layer? I think what we probably think is that, well, so firstly, I mean, there's a difference between I'm a developer, I want to change my schema and see what's happening and keep developing my app versus the apps in production, I'm going to just I'm just going to do it and you know see what see what breaks. I, th I think there's a big I think there's a big difference between those two things. I, I think. Um, well, well, by the way, I wasn't yeah. trying to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The second use case is great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's a novel. That's a novel yeah. use case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what 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 Degraf would say is that you know you've you know you've gone through this development process. You've you, you're fine with this change, but we won't stop the database in order for you to make that change. It's more, it's more the flexibility that you're allowed with that schema. It's, it's, not, it's not that you just go and just do it in production. It's, it's more like um, the database will still be alive. You make the change and you know, the database is still serving data the whole time and it's less and less you know, <laughs> flying with, uh, with no seat belts. Yeah, well, actually, I, I think maybe I should have elaborated a little bit more, but it seems like with DGraph, you could make that kind of schema change but if you had a different schema that you were actually serving to the client, you can make that change at the database level. You can make those aggressive changes at the database level, and you can still have ways to kind of patch it up so that you're not introducing backward compatibility issues to the set of deployed clients on the field. Is that, is that something that you think is a valid use case for DGraph? I, I, I think if I, if I rephrase that, do you think it's possible to kind of, let's say the application's running live, and I, I, I can make a query to update the GraphQL schema and apply data migrations to DGraph um, synchronously or transactionally so that like the new version of the GraphQL schema that goes out and the database are, they work the way they should. Is that, is that a right, is that, is that a way to paraphrase it? So you can, you can certainly do that, but it wouldn't, it's not one transaction. You, ah, okay. The changing the schema is, doesn't happen okay. in a transaction. Um, okay. But you could, I mean, yeah, those sort of data migrations are always, right. you know, they, they take some time. But you can certainly, you can certainly change the schema and then um, migrate the data as a GraphQL update, right. you know, as, as, a, as a transaction. That, right. That's definitely a thing. So kind of, okay, we're going one more layer into the rabbit hole and then, I, I, and then we, we should move on to Q&A. So is, is there, is there a, like a, a blue-green story to the, this schema approach for, for DGraph? You know, I, I have this transform. It might be a disruptive transformation. And what I want to do, it, because it sounds like what you're saying is that you, you leave all the data intact on the nodes when you migrate the, the schema. Um, so technically, you should be able to execute two different schemas against the same underlying graph. Yeah. That's, we, I mean, we don't have, we don't have a blue-green um, option, but that, that's definitely true. You, you, sh you should be able to have two sort of views on the same graph, and you could have like a version one view and a version two view. You, you know, you've got version one running. You put version two there, and um, you start serving this, and then migrate away from that or something. That, that, that sounds definitely like you could do it. We, we don't have a story for that at the moment, um, but yeah, that, that would be a cool thing if you could present multiple views of the same, multiple you know, GraphQL views on the same database. Would be a would be a fun sort of thing. As in blue green deployments with GraphQL. Yeah, That'd be Gra GraphQL cool. blue green deployments. GraphQL blue green <laughs> Blog post in the making. <laughs> yeah, can I just? Uh... <laughs> All right. Um, so I think I think the the migration story for on the Hasura end is very similar to what a migration story looks like if you're using if you're building an API layer on top of something like Postgres, um, where you roll out a bunch of database migrations. Um, so you cannot you can never synchronously roll out the microservice API and the database migrations at the same time anyway, considering that they're going to happen independently. So what you do is you make these kind of uh, non-breaking changes to the underlying database first, right? Uh, and you do that either by replacing a table with a view or by adding a trigger so that if you're, if you're going to collapse first name and last name into a new column called name, right, you have like a trigger on the back that makes sure that if first and last name keep getting used by the older API, um, we'll keep updating the new name API, the new name column that's coming in. So there are kind of these standard practices that you do with databases anyway. Um, and, and the approach that we take at Hasura is that you kind of do the same thing because Hasura is kind of like a, an API layer that's sitting in front of the database. So you kind of roll out the database changes and then you roll out the Hasura change as well. We have tooling that kind of makes it easy to, to roll them out like one after the other or to roll them out together and stuff like that. So that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the approach that we take. Um, is that is it is it different for like how does it work with uh, with the AppSync uh, suite? Yeah, I mean I think 
I think in the one case, you know, with DynamoDB, um, you're, you're just kind of in a different right. world. Uh, you're, you're in a NoSQL world instead of a, a relational world, so that looks very different. I imagine the story is quite similar right. when you're using Aurora Serverless, though I don't have any hands-on experience with that. Um, so I think that uh, with the NoSQL approach, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot more flexibility because, again, you don't, have this, you don't have to have this maintain things like referential integrity and right. you don't have to have all these, right. these uh, constraints. Um, and in that case, um, you know, I think there's, there's lots of different approaches to moving <laughs> NoSQL databases uh, back and forth, right? The, the one, one approach that is very common is, is remarkably similar to, the, to the, uh, the graph database approach where you just kind of leave extra properties and you just, you, it's it's, there's, so much, there's so much uh, permissive serialization and deserialization going on that you, know, you just kind of leave fields there and then clean them up later, if, if ever. If ever, right? It might be useful yeah. later, you never know, right? <laughs> that's, you never that's delete right. data. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, I think I think the story is um, is very different and, and probably very difficult to generalize. Got it, got it, got it. Makes sense. Um, any questions from the audience? I th um, is somebody going to go with a with a mic? Um, Harsha, are you going to? Yeah. Hello. Uh, let's say I build an application from the scratch. Uh, which one of the services I should go for? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, since you guys explained all the three things, now I'm confused which one so I should I'll, start. I'll, I'll, repeat the, I'll repeat the question for the panel. The question is, so let's say I have one golden ticket and I can use any one of these three. Which one, <laughs> uh, which one should I? Um, mm, uh, <laughs> Getting, uh, getting us in trouble already, I see. Uh, I, no, uh, invalid question. There, 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 no, no, no. I, I, I misspoke. I said there's actually three golden tickets. <laughs> so you can, yeah, there's three golden tickets, actually. It's fine. You can use all three. Um, but any, any other questions? Um, I actually just wanted to make a <clears throat> sort of follow-up comment from the previous conversation that you guys were having. So in DGRA, what happens is we have the concept of storage type which is different from schema type. And at runtime, we can convert from a storage type to schema type. So you could have stored something as a string, but uh, if the schema changes to being a date time, then we can do a on-the-fly conversion because we know what the storage type was. And if the indices change, then we can recalculate the indices. So that allows you to have potentially multiple schemas, um, and they are all able to represent something as a string, as an integer, as a float, as long as that thing can be converted into one of these uh, types. So a clarif clarification, is this storage type kind of like a data transfer object? Um, the storage type is sort of everything internal to DGRAPH gets converted into a binary uh, and uh, binary format and we store the type that it was stored in along with the, along with the data itself. So, so as opposed to typical databases where the schema defines how you store things, in DGRAPH the schema guides how you store things but doesn't necessarily um, stop you from storing it as slightly different things. I think we have we have time for maybe one last question. Yeah. So uh, it's not no really, awkward questions allowed. Yeah, it's not really a question. Okay. So so Robert, you were asking for a RFC from Michael and Tanmay, right? So I have a request. Say suppose say uh, while querying a uh, field, say you have 20 fields in a type. Say you have a company and you have 20 fields in that. So if I want to query 18 fields, I have to write all of them individually. I think someone mentioned in the morning. So what if I don't want just two fields? So why would I write 18 fields? So is it, a, is it possible that I can just exclude two fields rather than mentioning all the 18 fields? Got it. No. <laughs> uh, no, no, okay, well, there's, 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 there's elaboration yeah, that's needed I'm, here. I'm Actually, one of, the, uh, one of the lesser known things about GraphQL is that the, the version that you all know is actually GraphQL v2. And uh, there was a version that was created internally at, Gra at Facebook uh, back in 2012. And that one had a unique feature called fat interfaces where you could, you could spread all the properties right. uh, using a fragment right. uh, without specifying, so you can basically Like a star, basically yeah. like a star? Yes, exactly, okay. it's, it's like a star, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and what, when you're talking about the exclude, you would have to have some sort, of, so exclude is basically star minus some set of fields. So we have to talk about why the fat interfaces was a bad idea. 
And the reason why fatter interfaces is a bad idea is because it breaks the backward compatibility rule. So if you write a query that says, I want to fetch this thing, and you have a fat interface expression inside that query, then um, if I go and change the type later, your response will contain an extra field that you didn't expect, right? Yeah. Which is, technically speaking, if you're not expecting that, I, I can't make any assumptions about what you're doing with that data once it gets on the client. So it could be a backward compatibility breaking change. And indeed, that is the kind of problem that came up with fat interfaces. So fat interfaces was one of these things that we consciously chose to remove uh, when we migrated internally from, from GraphQL you know, Got it. maybe V pre one, maybe V alpha, if you want to call it that, to, to the open source version that you yeah. know. I think, and I think maybe to add to that as well, um, it's a. I think the problem is the problem sounds more like a developer experience problem yeah. than a than a technical need, right? Like the the technical use case where you would want to get a star with a minus two is it, it, there are valid cases, but those cases are probably very low. What what it's actually is a developer experience problem, right? So maybe you're thinking of it like a graphical shortcut that lets you kind of type in a star minus whatever and then press a key and then it expands. Um, I think one of the tools that is, that, that is very nice and this is um, OneGraph has a tool called OneGraph Explorer and a lot of graphical interfaces like Hasura Graphical has that integrated inside the console where it kind of makes it very easy for you to select everything and then unselect the ones that you don't want, which is not exactly what you're saying, but it, it seems like a developer experience problem more than a technical thing, no, right? Even, so if you have that, it would decrease the size of the payload. So in, in a way, you are. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. But I mean, I guess in that case, yeah. Rob, what Rob said. Yeah. Saying? Well, <laughs> in, in the case of decreasing the the payload size, you're just talking about the query text itself, yes. right? Yeah. And that's yeah, that's nice. But there's also another mechanism for that with persisted queries. So in practice, you know, if you if you if you get to the point where your query size, the, the GraphQL up. document yeah. size, is a concern, you know, you're transferring. This repetitive 3K document with every single request. And oh, you persistent start, queries is just a yeah. And the moment you start right. using persistent queries, that that problem, that entire yeah. problem goes away. Yeah. yeah. So in in the uh, sort of non GraphQL query language, I've dealt with a sort of slightly not compliant query language. We do allow a, a thing like that, but we normally, for the for the same reasons everyone else has said, is that's a nice thing when you like are exploring an API or you're. You know, you know, some interface, and you just want to grab right. everything and see what's right. there. It, it's less of a less of a nice thing yeah. when you're writing an app for, for the same reasons they've said, as well as, like we said before, that's a really intentional thing when you're writing an app. I, I actually right. want these four fields because that's what's that's what my app cares about. So it's okay to have to list all of them yeah. um, at that point. Yeah, I think. Um, and, and and I think I, our our previous version of a DSL that we had before GraphQL, which was kind of like our version of GraphQL, we used to allow a star operator as well, and then everybody would just be like, yeah, star dot star dot star dot star. <laughs> I don't care. So what if this is cyclic? <laughs> star dot star dot star dot star. <laughs> yeah, and if you remember the, the talk I gave uh, at this event last year, with my, my case against GraphQL, which is that, that that was one of the examples in the overfetching case. It's That's still true. possible to it's, do yeah, in GraphQL. Yeah, 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 and so yeah, you yeah. kind of open that up too. And, and yeah. I think what, uh, what we're, where we want GraphQL to be is, this, is a, is a process that, yeah. that, that kind of um, nudges you in, into best practices, right? So, so by, by having you declare the exact fields that you need, we're asking you to think about what the application, what the front end actually needs, as opposed to just kind of you know, grab yep. everything and then, and then subtract something Makes that sense. you don't. So it's slightly more thoughtful. Um, I, think, I think our time's up, but um, all, all three of us will be hanging around outside. Um, Rob will be hanging around outside for another three hours, after which he's flying back. Uh, <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to catch us outside uh, in the lobby. Um, and thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. I hope you guys had fun. Thank you all. Thank you.